our speakers hasn't arrived yet, but I think we're going to get going. Uh, welcome to the faculty panel for One Book 2013. As all of you know, we have the fabulous In the Heart of the Sea. And um, we are lucky today to have three um, wonderful presenters. You have to mention? Great. Do you guys want to sign in right there, please? Um, Bill Lawrence from the English department is going to present on what he's planning on doing. Um, Nan Loggins is going to talk about using it with history. Mary Reagan, who's not here yet, is going to talk about biology. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how I'm going to use snippets of it in um, CSS 101. And so if any of the rest of you who are here are thinking of using parts of it, we hope that towards the end, um, you'll have a chance to just add. We really only have the hour. Um, because I guess the room is in use, so. Well, I think a lot of people have to go to a meeting at three. We'll have to go to a meeting at three, yeah. so okay, so we'll try to be prompt. So, again, this is our fifth year with one book, and um, we are thrilled. And Gabby and Denise and I, who conspired um, six years ago, basically, to think about how we could start a one book here at BCC with no recognition and no money, but we found a lot of enthusiasm on campus. And even that first year, we were able to scrape up enough funds to have a wonderful program. Each year, I think it's grown, gotten more recognition on campus. We were thrilled that Dr. Sobrega, in the, uh, on opening day this year, not, uh, noted that we have a one book. And because we want it to be an official part of Bristol Community College. And of course, as a reading specialist, anything that encourages reading and engagement is something that I support. And I know that's true for all of you as well. Um, so without further ado, I think we will start with the presentations. And Bill has been kind enough to open talking about how he's planning to use the book um, in his English class. So I teach uh, English 101, uh, which is the course that I'm using this book for. And really glad I chose this uh, this book to, to adopt it for this semester because um, it's it's a really enjoyable read and it, I'm really really op has opened up uh, the door to so many different things I can do with my students. Um, I'm not I'm, I have three sections of, of 101 this semester. Um, one of them is online and I have assigned the whole book for, for, for that course for that section. For my other two sections of 101 seated uh, face to face, uh, we're only doing excerpts from the book. So we'll do like uh, the preface, chapter one, chapter two. Chapter 12 is a big chapter because that's kind of where uh, all the action comes in. Um, but, uh, I, and, the, and I'm actually on it right now. It actually just came from my class. We were just talking about the, the book. And the, the seated classes, I'm going to spend just about three, three class sessions uh, with the book uh, before moving on. It's going to culminate in a, uh, an, an argumentative editorial assignment um, for, the, for the 101 students, for regardless of uh, what face-to-face what, uh, -face or online. For the online students, they have a, little, a bit more built into um, the, the component because uh, they, instead of being there in the class talking about it, they have the discussion questions to make up for that, uh, being an online student. So there's a lot more discussion that will probably be built off of that. And I wish I had known, because so many great things are already coming up about the book as we're getting into it, that uh, I wish I would have known that, because it's, uh, I would have stretched it out a little longer in my schedule. Uh, but it, it's, just, it's just right to, to do what I need for it. Um, the first, the first thing that I really, um, the obvious reason why we're studying it and the, the, benef the benefits to bringing in a nonfiction book like this, obviously the narrative itself, uh, this is a historical narrative, so we're examining it for the, the elements of narrative, um, description, so the rhetorical modes of description uh, writing, that's another one. and. Um, Sentences. Sentences are actually something that early on in the semester uh, I usually do something with uh, great sentences and I, I kind of carry it through the rest of the semester. We pick out uh, the most exciting sentences in a reading 
and I have them bring in uh, their own selections, and I like to point them out and put them up on the board or on the screen, and uh, just kind of just examine it on the sentence level. Uh, so those are three basic uh, English reasons and three three benefits to using this book in an English class. Uh, the second big thing that I do with this is uh, I tap into the critical thinking, and that sets us up for um, the next. The big pro the first big project they have is the editorial that I mentioned. So that's an argumentative editorial. They're all going to do that in a, in a collaborative fashion. So they're going to post their editorials digitally, and then they're going to be able to read uh, four or five others in, in a group, and then they're going to be able to respond to those editorials uh, in a letter to the editor. So that assignment really is just kind of uh, getting them into getting the persuasive writing out of their system before they get into the more objective, informative research writing that we do later. Um, but this is, it's really, we're building off of some big concepts here in this book uh, that we have, we've already encountered. It's, it, the students are really, really engaged into the issues. And so I think one of the big things that we're, we're getting into is the, the superiority uh, that we uh, kind of feel uh, that, the, that these individuals kind of had over uh, nature. So that the whole uh, oppression and control and destruction of nature, whether it's the natural environment or a particular species uh, in the environment, uh, that's something that's coming up. So I'm kind of, I'm trying to push them to compare the whaling industry, the industry itself, and uh, the mentality that went into that, uh, compare that with some things that are going on today. So uh, it may, that was whale oil then in the 1800s. Now we just have a different type of oil. But it's really the same game. We've just changed the names. Um, so that in my, in my English classes, I, I bring in culture. I bring in sociology, anthropology. So there's a lot of good discussion that we can build off of in, in a book like this. We have you know, the cannibalism uh, conversation that's in here. Uh, we, you know, we have the whaling industry, and uh, they're they're you know killing just you know thousands, maybe millions of whales, um, which is an unheard of thing today. There are still a few uh, nations uh, that that still do that, and they get around that with a loophole. And maybe our science panelists will uh, be able to share a little bit more about that. Japan is notoriously uh, one of them, but um, so we get into issues of science. We do touch on some of those things. Uh, in, in while we're in that critical thinking, but the third, the third, the big third part that we uh, that this book I think is setting us up for is uh, for all the, all those environmental problems that are usually the foundation of my research papers that I assign. So the research papers that I assign are are usually built off of solutions, um, various solutions to health and environmental issues. So uh, some students might write papers about wind power, some students might write papers about solar power, and uh, other various things that contribute to solving the problems and not necessarily concentrating on, yeah, I don't like the students to just be bogged down in all the problems and it could be real downer uh, after a while. So we, as an optimist and a futurist, I kind of bring in uh, you know, those solutions. So this is kind of setting the stage for that. We're looking at act, the act one of the, it's, it's not just the, the problem, it's the, the mentality of some of the problems that still exist today. So we're examining that, we're seeing how, so I, I might be looking at this book very differently than some other folks. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of looking at them as, as the villains here. They're the antagonists. And the whale is really the, the, the hero here. So. Um, it's kind of the animal rights perspective, maybe, but um, but that's kind of the way I approached it, and the, and the students have been very responsive to it so far. So that's great, thank you. Um, I think we'll go through, and then at the end we'll take questions. Um, you want to go ahead. Yeah, I'm Nan Loggins, and I teach a variety of history classes, and I'm using this book in my History 113, the first half of U.S. history this semester in a class I'm teaching up in Attleboro. And um, I'm going to be doing a number of things 
with the, the book, but of course the course itself is a survey course, so I'm limited to maybe spending about a week to two weeks and a half on it. But that said, I've had the students begin reading the book because I was afraid if I had assigned it for only a week or two, it just wouldn't get read. So they've started reading it. And then we're also having short journal entries, and at the end they will write a reflection paper. In addition, they're all responsible for coming up with discussions discussion questions. I'll provide some too, but I want them to kind of delve into the book and come up with open-ended discussion questions, and we'll spend part of a class doing that. Um, we're very fortunate. I happen to teach this class on Friday mornings, and that is when the same day that Nathaniel Philbrick will be speaking. So we'll take it. It's a good sized class. It has over 30 students. We'll take them all over to the Attleboro um, Auditorium. And I think it's going to be Skyped in. So they'll all be watching that. So it'll be nice for them to participate in that. As Bill was saying, there's so much in this book. And from a historical standpoint, you have class, you have religion, you have economics family. There's, there's just so much you can do. I do something similar to what you mentioned. I sort of, I call it fast forward. So we can do a similar type of thing where we compare what was going on then to things today. And it helps them find the material relevant. I'm also going to be showing excerpts of the PBS American Experience um, Into the Deep movie. It's about two hours long, so I can't devote the whole movie of the class. Um, but we'll see some excerpts of that. And um, there will also be a question on the midterm, just so they, they continue on. There's also, we would love to go down to the New Bedford Whaling Museum, but realistically that would be hard to get a field trip down there given students' schedules. But I've checked out a number of online um, sites for different museums, so they will have an assignment where they go out to the New Bedford Whaling Museum, um, MIT has um, the Heart Nautical Collection. And they can go in and explore that online. Um, Mystic Seaport has a digital collection, so that could be another um, place that they can check things out. I think that's what we'll be doing in, up in Attleboro on History 113. That sounds great. And, um, certainly for history, there's so much in it. Um, and now we're switching to the more science-oriented perspective. So. Um, I teach Biology 232, which is marine biology, and um, I'm Mary Rupin, just so you don't know me. Um, and I have to say, first of all, that it's a real challenge to incorporate a, a one book into a science class. We're, we're already giving our students dense textbooks that they need to read and to tell them to read a whole other book, as enjoyable as it might be, and then fit it in amongst all the content that we need to, to teach is, is really difficult. But um, but I feel like this book has so many good <coughs> moments in it for um, for my class. So what I'll be doing is using excerpts uh, rather than than having them read the entire book. Um, and and I have to say I'll, I'll make a plug here for as many faculty as possible to use one books because that, that would actually make it a lot easier for me if my students were reading it in other classes. But <laughs> they're not. <laughs> they have nine in this class, so so um, I don't think any of them currently are reading it. But um, so what I've latched on to in the book are two things. One is um, problem solving and navigation. So um, there's a, a really interesting part when they are in an area and they're not able to catch any fish and they're not able to find anything. It talks about the particular latitudes that they're at. Um, so I'm planning on using that as uh, probably as a take home um, exam question to ask my students to really think about why is it in this area, what are the problems? What are the wind currents like? What are the wave currents like? Why is it that this is not a productive area of the ocean? And, and have them um, explore that. So that's one thing that I want to do. Um, the other thing that, that I want to talk with them about later in the semester, we'll be getting to fisheries. And this, at this point in the semester, we're talking about ecology. So when we get to fisheries later on, I want to talk about the whaling industry and how they could have had a management plan at this time that would have helped them. Why they had to go so far away to find the whales. What was it about the ecology of whales that makes it, uh, their populations so vulnerable? Um, so we'll incorporate some of that. 
thank you very much. Um, and I'm Sally Gabb, as I said, and I'm um, actually I'm also a reading specialist and have taught reading, but I'm teaching CSS right now, and I decided I could use just excerpts from the book in the CSS class because in really one of the primary purposes of CSS is to enable students to think about how they're going to survive here at VCC. So I'm looking at survival and what are the human components of survival. And one of the things I'm going to do to help them think about it, you notice this ribbon that I have here. And if I take this other piece of it, oops, and walk back here, whoops. <laughs> Just, I want to type, whoops. <laughs> Sort of like what happened to them on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> this is about the, the size of the boat from here to the back of the room. It's the size of the boat that, that seven men in each of the boats had to survive in. And because I wanted them to think about the physicality of this message, what it meant, and we'll look at um, the larger boat and how big it was. Because think about how big was the whale? 85 feet. This is 30 feet. So think about three, you know, three times the length of this room. And that would be the size of this whale. And that whole thing of thinking about dimensions and what it meant to, um, for this whale to be large enough to really destroy the Essex. Um, and I've made a little handout. I think I have just barely enough. If you want to pass those on YouTube. And if I don't have quite enough, whoops, then I'm going to have to, Gabby, I'll get you one at home. Or you can share with people in the English department. Or actually, here, I can give you. I'm going to keep my original. <laughs> but you can see. And I want to point out to students something about, first of all, about moving beyond the text that you're given. Because I had so much fun Googling a number of things, the dimensions of whale boats. And I found and this wonderful picture that I put on the cover here so that they can actually see what those boats look like in um, more of a sort of current form than was in the book itself. Um, and then on the... Um, on the, the back of the page, there is a whole thing about the whale boat, um, which I've discovered what was in it. Uh, but the whale boats had a crew of six, but I think there were at least seven originally, because there were 21 people on the Essex, and they had three boats. So I think there were originally seven in each one. Um, talked about what was in those boats. So how do you get prepared? So that's another question. What did they have to get prepared with? What do you have to get prepared with as a student? Because that's a part of your survival. Um, I also made sure that we talked about the importance of morale and hope. And um, the pages that I identified on the front of this are pages that talk about those issues and how important morale and hope was once they got on those boats out in the Pacific. Also. What were the responses to catastrophe as the food ran out? And this is where I'll have them sit in groups and talk about what would they have done and if they had these things and what would they have saved. And, and then, of course, the last part, the human capitalism, the extreme response. And just to talk about what kind of extreme responses to difficulties might they have in college not that anyone might think it's like that, <laughs> but at least it's like thinking. Well, what's an extreme response when you start getting into trouble in college? Well, it might be personal behaviors. It might be something like drinking too much, not sleeping enough, um, avoiding your work. Um, what are some of the extreme responses to particular classes? And just thinking about that concept and how you make those choices. So that those are concepts that I thought would fit into just thinking about the theme of CSS and survival here at college but also um, thinking about how important it is to get into um, history and what it teaches us from the past 
and that all of them are going to have to take a history or economics class anyway. And also just um, the sciences, as you said, what, what are they going to confront and how this book covers the range of the disciplines. So those are the ways that I'm going to talk about it in my CSS class and have them think about primarily those themes of morale and hope, um, being prepared, and uh, survival. So, I mean, I had a lot of fun finding the passages that would be enough to use without wearing them out in terms of because my students in CSS have to do readings and write reflections every week anyway. That's part of the way I teach it. But this at least bring in talking about when you have content and how you can make it personal and make it your own. And so it was really fun to think about how I could use this book in that context. So um, that's our presentation. How many of the rest of you are planning to use at least part of the book in your classes? Well, that's fabulous. That's fabulous. So I think this is a good time for you to, if you have any questions from any of us, or want to share with us what you're going to do that may build on some of the things that we've said, or something that's a little different, particularly anything that's sort of interesting and outlandish. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone building a cardboard whale boat for the cardboard boat races? <laughs> Which I thought would be great. Um, so, the field is open, please. Respond, talk about what you're going to do. I just have a question about, you said the PDF into the deep. What is that? Um, it's um, from their American Experience program. And there's an episode that they did, I want to say two or three years ago, called Into the Deep. And it's available on DVD. And so it's through Netflix or something like that. So it's, it's, a, it's about, I'm sorry, it's about the whale industry. Oh, it's about the whale industry. It's two hours long. So I'm only going to show you that, because I bought my purchase And there are, if you go out and you search on it, there's a, there are a lot of sources there, you know, teacher type sources, but you can certainly use them at the college level too. I think there's a little clip by Philbrook in the documentary, isn't there? I think there is. I think, yeah, he's interviewed. There's one on YouTube talking about Nantucket. Mm -hmm. And act, no, actually it was Moby Dick. Why you should read Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. It's just five minutes. I have a question to go because I'm trying to steal your ideas from my own class. <laughs> um, well I'm so I'm using the book in one and one and one and two. And what I what I've I realized I sort of created a system for myself with one book where I sort of teach the class as I teach the class any semester, but I integrate um, assignment options that are based on book usually, so they can do you know, sort of stuff from other readings as well, but if somebody's really excited about the book, then they can choose it. And most students choose at some point to, to take one of the assignments and relate it to the book. But um, as far as the editorial, I think that's a great idea. And so what are, what are they writing about? Like, do they have topics? Are they related to the book? Are they related to current issues in the book that are current day, connected, or? Yeah, they're taking the, that, that concept that I was talking about um, in terms of the, the superiority over nature and somehow examining something from today. Okay. So there's a bit of comparison that's involved in it. But I just stole an idea from you. So that's good. So, yeah, I like that option of giving them an option in there. Um, I had to fit it in early on because I didn't know what else to do because I, I have the research projects that I have something going for already. Right. And so this kind of replaced, I think it, I don't, I don't think it bumped, uh, it didn't quite bump Maya Angelou out, but, but it bumped a few other writers out of the narratives that I usually use. Yeah. So I usually have other narrative essays uh, two, two or three every class session uh, or per week and uh, this took the place of the narratives and descriptive samples that we usually look at. Yeah, they so, do. But you, and that's it's a great source for that though because the narrative writing is really great. Yeah. Thanks. I, I'm just so grateful that you're all sharing this because it's really I don't know, it helps with my morale that there's such great stuff going on at the college and that these kind of, um, you know, we work in our silos and yet we unify through one book 
in ways that are really creative and inspiring. And so I'm really grateful for this. Um, I had a, just to share that I, I have a one size fits all for one book um, that I don't know that I can do this semester and I'm in a panic. So, uh, but what, what I've done in the past is I've sought out um, positive and negative responses to the text and then I give them to the class and they have to frame a position on the one book personally about how they uh, come to it, uh, how they essentially evaluate it, how they judge it. And then use the source material, um, the secondary sources, as support or to confront um, faulty logic in the writing of the critiques of the book. But damn, I'm having hard such a hard time. Yeah, I've yeah. it's really hard. I was looking up negative reviews on this text, and they're just not out there. I mean, the closest I came were some sort of blog-like uh, responses <laughs> on Amazon. From, and this one guy went on a some kind of a diatribe about how it's boring and it's inaccurate, etc. And I thought, okay, but this is fairly well written and has some great logical fallacies in it that. Hopefully the students can jump on, but right below it are responses to <laughs> the, like, <laughs> you know when they did the work for the students. So I'm having a bear of a time. I think I'm going to have to give this up. So again, I thank you because <laughs> I don't know if anyone's come across that because it is one of the things that makes me insecure about one book is um, the investment I have to make with staying staying responsive and fresh to inventing curriculum, which is really hard. And I'm doing it for another course I'm doing right now, and it makes me feel anxious and overwhelmed. So I like the one-size-fits-all <laughs> approach. And I like that sort of in principle about what, um, Nan, you're doing seems like it could rinse, lather, repeat with another one book, in that, you know, open-ended questions. You know, you can apply that to any text, right? And likewise, with yours, Bill, like seeing the Apply relevancy to a topic of the day is relevant. I don't know that it would always work with Mary or Sally like no. yours, but you know, if you're reading about you know something going on in India, you know, you won't find about the jet stream maybe or whatever it is that might be relevant to your class. But that I think is helpful and is a really good sales pitch to promote one book is to see modeling by other um, professors and how they apply it, and that it can be done without as much angst as I bring to it, typically. Thanks. Other comments, thoughts, the ways you're going to use the book? Yes, Gabby. Well, I'm trying a, a slightly different approach from what I've done in the past when I've used one book. I'm, they have to read the whole book. I'm teaching two sections of 101 at Attleboro. Uh, but I put in my syllabus, this is a course where you don't have to memorize anything. And I want you to really enjoy this book. And I told them first day, this is a book we're going to be reading throughout the semester, uh, chapter by chapter. Mm -hmm. So it's not an onerous task, although uh, one of the youngest students in the class read it the first week. She finished the whole thing. Wow. And, um, but we talk about it every week, and they've been keeping up. So I just I wanted to get that <coughs> essence of just some pleasure in reading without mm -hmm. having to worry that they were going to be tested on it, because there's plenty of other stuff that they have to do to get their grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also uh, have that option of uh, using some ideas in the book uh, as uh, the basis for a, an essay assignment. So I'll see how that goes. So far, um, they're thinking about it. And um, we also have been using the, the modes, obviously, the rhetorical modes, because it fits so beautifully. Uh, and uh, in every chapter, you can identify uh, use of, of the modes. And I also want them to start thinking about themselves as potentially leaders uh, when they get out into the professional world. So we're tracing um, the development uh, of, of the characters 
who are the leaders in the group, and looking at the different styles, you know, Chase and Pollard, very different, and you know, how do you feel at work now, um, you know, in terms of how your supervisors treat you? Eventually, you're going to go into a professional field where you're going to be a leader, you know, and how do you, we're starting to think about that too and seeing how, how leadership is modeled in different ways and as we're going along and it starts to unfold as, 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 as you go further into the text. Right, there's so many aspects of human interaction that this touches because it's this tiny community of people but it reflects just so many aspects of human interaction, both the positive and the challenges of people interacting. Yes. I, I'm using it similar to the way Gabby is. This is English 091, so it's one of the newer, um, we're still calling them pilot courses, but it's the integration of reading and writing. So these are developing reading and writers. And what I love about this book is that it's, a, I think, a, a rigorous text. It's not easy to read, but there's a lot of pleasure in it. And so we're kind of approaching it um, and similar to Nan to like a lot of journaling about it and a pretty low stakes writing assignment at the end but there's discussion each week we're reading the entire book and so in their journal reflection students can they can write about something they found fascinating or they can write about how difficult it was to read like both of those things are part of the discussion so we're kind of approaching it as we do get carried away because the book is interesting. Like eventually it will be about the content of the book, but students can also talk about why chapter one was so difficult or how are they getting through this chapter? Like did anyone have a strategy for how to get through these chunks of pages that were slow? And so the book is good for both of those things, both for how, how to read this college level text, you know? And a lot of students say, I don't know this language. Like they said, the language feels foreign, and so we've talked about that in terms of college level reading versus some of the reading they've done before. So I, I feel like this is, I haven't used one book a lot before, I've used excerpts, this is the first time I've used a whole book, but it's such a perfect book That's for those great. two conversations. Not only is it Lots of beautiful sentences in mm -hmm. it. I agree. Yes. <laughs> Oh, and, and difficult sentences. My students can't read, they can't write, and they can't spell. Can't do math up. either, but... Yeah, speak up. I, I, I was just kind of making a, a, a comment. I said, my students can, can't read, they can't write, they can't spell properly, and they can't do math. Uh, and that's problematic. That's something else. So they see a book that's well-written, words are spelled properly and properly punctuated, and no wonder they can't understand it. It's more. Yes, I happen to have two um, students in this particular class that I'm teaching who have accommodations for learning differences, who are permitted to have like books on tape or, or whatever. And I think one of the great things about this selection is it is available as a book on CD and it's also available on Audible. Um, so it makes it approachable to students who do have your next one. Yes, thank you. So I've been thinking a lot about you know purposes of one book at a college and um, to respond to what Dave was talking about. So a lot of our students haven't read the book from cover to cover for pleasure. It's a completely foreign experience, and uh, by all these interesting ways that it's being approached in various classrooms, it gives an opportunity to. Um, be able to do that, and that just that accomplishment alone, um, regardless of what uh, discipline they're reading it in, um, and even if you know the spelling leaves a lot to be desired, still people can access these books um, for their content. So when you're for this book, when we're looking at issues of um, racism and classism and what happens, you know, what, what are the unwritten laws of the sea? Um, once uh, people get in the boat, uh, who dies first? Um, and I made a little chart, I kept track of it as I was reading, and it's, it's not looking good for the non-native Nantucketers. Um, <laughs> or things like fear, 
um, and irony. How ironic that they didn't want to sail towards the closest land for fear of cannibalism. That's all I'll say in case you haven't read the end. Um, <laughs> but these issues that um, come up, even though some of our students' reading ability is, is not where we'd like it to be when they walk into our classrooms, that they can still access this and have a reading experience. Um, and I think that's one of the most important aspects of this project. Um, and when more people spread the word, I mean, we, we're still, in five years, we're still at about a 10% cap, about so roughly 1,000 students across classrooms are, are getting the book. So we have about 10,000 people. So I don't know what to do to, to break, out, break out of that ceiling, but I think things like this and, you know, more people from different disciplines is, is a big part of that. So slowly but surely, I think, uh, you know, we can make some impact in our students' reading. Well, we have, there is a place where people could post their ideas of how they're using the mm -hmm. book, right? On the blog. On the blog. So I encourage you, who, particularly folks that are here, look up the blog and post your ideas of how you're using it. And then we can advertise to the campus how people are using the book. Because even next semester, the book's on campus now. So second semester, there may be people who aren't using it this semester, but we decide to use it next semester. Because now they've got some ideas that you have shared. So it would be great if you look up the blog. And also, just like today, we all have gotten ideas from hearing what people have said. And it's great to share that and spread the enthusiasm. Yeah. I teach 102, <coughs> writing from literature. And it's a genre course. But I would prefer thematic. And this was my opportunity. I threw out my previous syllabus that I still in the process of reworking the last half of it, but I have done life as a voyage. <laughs> and I have to step outside of that once in a while to get certain points across in, in genre field. But <clears throat> now I've just wrapped up the poetry unit, and I, I started them with Maysfield Sea Fever. And then I had them do some looking at two later poems he wrote, uh, one about an anxiety of a young man to get out of the city and to see, and the other one about a man who was ready to die on the desolate sands. And we compared that with uh, a, a good uh, alliterative translation of the seafarer. Did uh, the Battle of Lepanto, the uh, the control of the Mediterranean between the uh, European countries and the Ottoman Turks, and that kind of came into today uh, with situations. And I'm just having a ball. Uh, both Shakespeare in plays, Othello and Tempest, because I don't do the same one in the same in the classes, uh, have a connection. And I'm doing a novella um, rather than a heavy novel, like doing Old Man and the Sea in one course, <laughs> and I'm doing Voyage of the Dawn Treader from the Chronicles of Narnia in the other. And I've got some short stories that, that fill in. Ray Bradbury did a great one about a monster that fell in love with a White House. <laughs> <laughs> so as I say, I'm stepping outside the theme when I need to, but I'm really having a wonderful time. <laughs> That's great. I just want to point out, there's a, for poetry, I don't know if you noticed this, but on page 61 of the boat, um, and talk about how I found the whole poem you, in 16 lines. I gave it to Right, you. because this is yeah. 30 hogs in the Isle of May, duff every other day, oh, butter and cheese as much as you could sway, and now you want more beef, damn you? <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> that great. <laughs> I thought that was great. So, and again, because, um, I talk about in our CSS how we remember things and how songs and poetry and, and how they can, that's something that those guys remembered because he said it in that way so often. God sends me, the devil sends cooks. <laughs> <laughs> that's an old day he said. I just wanted to say a quick word about the blog. I think it's, um, the blog is a little difficult to find right now, but I think that's in process of being fixed. So I just wanted people to know the easiest way to find it right now is just to go onto the BCC website in the little search box up at the upper right-hand corner and type in one book, one word, capital O, capital B, 
and you will find it. It will come right up top of the list. But if you go to like our list of blogs, you will get frustrated. <laughs> so, so people don't get frustrated. Just go right there, search it out, and you'll find it quickly. And it's great. The blog's really good. Yeah. Is there any chance of a Nantucket trip? Well, um, I think that that's an individual thing. Certainly, we have the I mean, just trip. yeah. Free, there's free access, of course, to the whaling museum. And I think if that's you're interested in that and would want to propose, you know, people who might want to sign up for it, certainly, because I've never been to Nantucket, and that's one thing I'm yeah, interested well, in. It's a bit pricey. But what I'm thinking about um, in one of the the interviews that was passed out, the the person who was interviewing. Philbrick said that they got a tour from him. I thought, well, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> you just have to ask, like, sa um, like Connie did. Like Connie did. Like Connie did. Like Connie did. Like Would he be interested in giving a tour? Or hey, Matt, how about a tour? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, after the first time I read the book years, years ago when it first came out, um, I decided to make a pilgrimage to Nantucket because I just was so fascinated by the story. And uh, the Whaling Museum on Nantucket has a wonderful Essex room. It's a tiny little room, wow. but it's full of artifacts um, that survived. Um, so there's that to see. They also have um, the jawbone of a sperm whale that was likely about the same size as the whale that right. the Essex. Um, mm -hmm. it's, about, it's two stories high. You know, a, a tall man could stand under the, the V shape of the jawbone. Yeah. Um, and then I also got a little map and walked around and found a couple of houses that belonged to um, Captain Pollard and first mate Owen Chase. Owen Chase. It's pretty yeah. interesting if you can spend a little time on Nantucket because um, the book, you know, just sort of comes alive there. So as for can we arrange a trip, you know, uh, our budget is as low as the water was at the end of this book, so I don't know about that, but we have some ideas. Right, and we proposing. could certainly set up a possible date and maybe get a, a benefit of, you know, if enough people sign up for the trip to Nantucket. Never know. I'm inspired Throw by Connie's, Connie's phone calls, right, to see if we can work something out. That's a great idea. Any other comments? How you're using the book? How what you think about it? Future for one book ideas? Yeah. Uh, similar to what Betsy said um, in my own I know class, I said keep you know as you read, just keep a list of interesting facts that you read because I find that I keep writing down things that I think are interesting. And one of the students said there must have been some connection to coffee because. He said the name's Folger and Star <laughs> Starbucks. And they said, well, what if you look into that? See if there is a connection. Um, but they, they find a lot of things that they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yes, just as a little additional thing, you know, these, these wonderful uh, moments can happen in, in part of the discussion where um, you, you learn stuff you didn't expect to. and. Um, I, I agree with Betsy there. Some parts of the book are tough going uh, for some readers, but um, so far they seem to be getting through it. And um, I try to make it a point if there's some reference that I'm not sure they might be familiar with, I'll ask. And, and one day I said, uh, anybody hear of Dante? Because Philbrick compares uh, the scene of you know, trying out uh, the whale uh, on the, on, on the ship to uh, the Inferno. And so um, in the first class, no one had heard of Dante, so I talked about that a little bit. Second class, a student who um, has been long out of school and isn't too sure of himself yet, raised his hand and said, I started reading The Inferno. I found it in a bookstore, and I'm reading it. Wow, <laughs> wow how cool is that? <laughs> and it's not easy to read, but oh, you know, it's wonderful. You see him put all his enemies in the worst kind of places. And <laughs> but isn't that great to yeah. find that out? I never would have found, we never would have found that out. But now everybody in the class knows that, you know, Here's somebody who just went out independently and read one of the greatest poets. 
And I, I think sharing these events in class, how it's brought out these kinds of things, again, if we can put that on the blog, if we can have a record for the next one book, how did people find this really inspired, um, got students more actively interested in the material that you're working with? You know, any of those things, that those surprises that happen in the class, those moments, we often lose them. So if we can collect those kinds of stories from our class, it reinforces the idea that doing a one book has real um, academic and intellectual purpose. So, other comments, questions? Thoughts for one book? Yes. Well, I made a recommendation to several people. Excuse me. Uh, <coughs> I would like to throw out the title, Bill Bryson's a short history of practically everything. Oh, yes. Now I come in from a science and math background. I'm not a liberal art person, but he takes a lot of the um, crap out of science and presents uh, a lot of this stuff is discovered almost accidentally. Uh, he's somewhat sarcastic. The English is excellent. It's properly wrote, uh, punctuated, spelled properly, and good mm -hmm. construction and all that. Uh, but it kind of takes some of the mystique off of science. I'm just sick of people. I don't do science, I don't do math, it's scary. And this takes the, the scare out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, relatively long book, about 316 pages, something like that. Uh, written back beginning of this century, about 2003, I think it was published. Some of the stuff that he wrote about in there, uh, we've learned some more stuff since then. Uh, but it's certainly, <clears throat> a good way of presenting about science. It's not science, it's about science and what's to people. Question? It's the short history. Yeah, short history of practically everything by Bill Bryson. Oh, practically everything, right. It takes the mystique out, but it puts the wonder back. Yeah, I, I, I mean, in some ways. But, but I love that book. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and he's such a, uh, I don't want to say sarcastic because it's not really, uh, that's not the right term, but he's. Uh, very He's going to edge. He's edgy. Right, right. Well, that's. Um, and he was an American who went to England and then came back and went back. People right. have already been suggesting some titles for next year, so I do have a list. I'll add it. To Would that. you please? I will. Yeah, his Walk in the Woods was suggested for this year mm -hmm. when he did the Appalachian Trail. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that was the that first book. Okay. Any other thoughts? Parting thoughts, anyone? It's been a great discussion. I certainly picked up a few things from people. It's great. And again, don't forget to check out the blog. And if you've made a comment about what you're doing, how you're using it, put it on the blog so we can share that with other people and um, really expand the enthusiasm. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. There's more cookies and more coffee for anyone. We don't have much time, 10 minutes before the 3 o'clock meeting. But um, welcome to stay and chat further. So thank you so much. And thanks for the presenters.